Hi, and welcome to my channel. In this video, we will be discussing the cardiovascular system, specifically the blood. In a later video, we will be looking at the heart. If you enjoy this video and its contents, I ask that you please support me so that I can continue to make videos for you. Please like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications for this channel. In this video, we will be looking at the functions of blood, the physical characteristics of blood, components of blood, formation of blood cells, red and white blood cells, and platelets and their differences, and hemostasis. Blood contains plasma and formed elements and transports essential substances through the body. One important thing to remember as we go through this chapter is that blood is the only fluid connective tissue. Let's take a look at the functions of blood. One of the functions of blood is transportation. Blood transports oxygen from the lungs to the cells of the body and carbon dioxide from the body cells to the lungs for exhalation. Blood also transports heat and waste products to various organs for elimination. It also carries nutrients, hormones, as well as other important substances throughout the body and to the different tissues. Another function of blood is regulation. The blood maintains homeostasis for all body fluids. It helps to regulate pH, body temperature, and influences water content of the cells. And finally, the third function of blood is protection. When we get injured and we start to bleed, there are certain factors within the blood that allow for clotting. We also have white blood cells, and white blood cells are really important in our immunity. We'll be talking about both these ideas uh, later on in the chapter. The physical characteristics of blood include that its temperature is 38 degrees Celsius or 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. You can see that this is slightly warmer than normal body temperature, which is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Now this is the temperature of blood and not the body. Its pH sits at 7.35 to 7.45. Its color can vary slightly. No, you don't have blue blood, that is a myth. Um, its color is either um, a bright red, if it's highly oxygenated, or we have um, blood coming from the veins that has lower oxygenation and it appears dark red. No blue blood. Um, volume is for males have a little bit more volume of blood than females. Males have about five to six liters and females four to five liters. Obviously these things change slightly, their averages depending on if you're taller, shorter, etc. Blood is also regulated by hormones including aldosterone, antidiuretic hormone, and atrial natriuretic peptide. I'll talk a little bit about these in the heart chapter and a lot more about them when we get to the urinary system. The components of blood include blood plasma and formed elements. Blood plasma is a watery liquid extracellular matrix that contains dissolved substances, while formed elements are the cells and cell fragments. Blood plasma consists of 91.5% water, 1.5% solutes, which include electrolytes, nutrients, gases, regulatory substances, and waste products, and 7% proteins. These are made up of 54% albumins. These are needed to help maintain blood osmotic pressure. Globulins, which make up 38% of the proteins. These are antibodies, which help in our immune defense. And fibrinogen, which makes up 7% of the proteins, and these proteins are important because they help form blood clots. Formed elements consist of red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. In this picture over on your right, you'll notice that red blood cells make up the majority of the formed elements. About 99% of the formed elements are red blood cells. So all of these are red blood cells, White blood cells, you'll see here, 
and what you'll also notice is that they look very different from one another. We'll talk about how you can tell white blood cells from one another. And then finally, the small little areas here, those cell fragments, are the platelets. The picture on the left shows a white blood cell, a red blood cell, and platelets. This picture is really nice because it comes from a scanning electron microscope where they've scanned through the layers and allows for a 3D view. And then they've gone back in to color it so that it can look the way that you see it. So this is um, showing a very close up of what those three types of blood cells look like. For those of you who like visuals, this uh, image shows it in a different way. Again, we're talking about blood plasma being 55%, being broken down into our proteins, water, and other solutes, same as we had just talked about, just putting it in uh, another way for you to see. And then the formed elements being 45%, mostly red blood cells, white, then we have white blood cells, and then platelets. You'll also notice that white blood cells are divided into many different types, which we'll talk about later and what they are used for. Hemopoiesis, also known as hematopoiesis, is the process by which the formed elements of the blood develop. Again, the formed elements include red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. The formation of these red blood cells, or hemopoiesis, occurs in the red marrow of the bones. Hemopoiesis, the formation of blood cells, including red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, occurs in the red bone marrow. However, before birth, hemopoiesis first occurs in the yolk sac of an embryo, and later in the liver, spleen, thymus, and lymph nodes of the fetus. Red bone marrow becomes the primary site of hemopoiesis in the last three months before birth and continues as the source of blood cells after birth and throughout life. Red bone marrow contains pluripotent stem cells. These cells have the capacity to develop into many different types of cells. In children, all bone marrow is red. While adults still do have some red bone marrow, most of it has turned yellow as it has become adipose tissue. Pluripotent stem cells have the ability to reproduce themselves, proliferate, which means they can increase rapidly in numbers, and also to differentiate into different types of cells. Red blood cells and platelets do not divide once they leave the red bone marrow. However, lymphocytes will continue to divide after they leave. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about pluripotent stem cells by discussing which cell types they differentiate into. Pluripotent stem cells can differentiate into either myeloid stem cells or lymphoid stem cells. Myeloid stem cells are the ones that give rise to red blood cells, platelets, monocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. These last four are white blood cells, and we'll talk about them more later on. The lymphoid stem cells give rise to lymphocytes. These are also white blood cells and include B cells, T cells, and natural killer cells. Hemopoietic growth factors are necessary to regulate the differentiation and proliferation of these different cell types. Erythropoietin increases the number of red blood cell precursors and is produced by the kidneys. Thrombopoietin stimulates the formation of platelets from megakaryocytes and is produced by the liver. Colony stimulating factors, cytokines, and interleukins are all necessary for the differentiation of different white blood cells. This process of white blood cell differentiation is quite complicated and usually gets covered in more detail during an immunology course. This figure is a really nice depiction of the differentiation of the pluripotent stem cell. 
we will notice that the pluripotent stem cell, like we just discussed, can differentiate into either the myeloid stem cell or the lymphoid stem cell. The myeloid stem cell can then differentiate into either a proerythroblast, which will then become a red blood cell, a megakaryoblast, which will then become platelets, um, and then we can either get the precursors for eosinophil, basophil, neutrophils, or monocytes. In order for it to differentiate into the different cell types, there are necessary factors for them. The lymphoid stem cell can differentiate into the T lymphocyte, the B lymphocyte, or a natural killer cell. Let's go ahead and start talking about the different types of formed elements in the blood, starting with red blood cells or erythrocytes. Erythrocytes have hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is an oxygen-carrying protein, and this pigment gives blood its red color. Hemoglobin constitutes about 33% of the cell's weight. There are about 5.4 million red blood cells per microliter of blood. Um, just to give you an idea, there's probably about 50 microliters in a drop. So you can multiply 50 times 5.4 million, and that will give you an idea of what's in a drop, since most of you probably don't know what a microliter is. And then imagine that a drop is pretty small. So there are a lot of red blood cells. They are a biconcave disc. They do lack a nucleus, so you can see their shape here, okay? They do lack a nucleus. They are biconcave, and because um, of this, they cannot reproduce. Their diameter is about seven to eight micrometers, so obviously they're pretty small since there are so many of them in the blood. One of the main purposes of a red blood cell is to be able to transport oxygen. Together with the fact that the red blood cell has no nucleus and that biconcave shape, it has a greater surface area and more room to be able to transport this oxygen. But how does it transport the oxygen? And we can look at the molecule that we find in red blood cells that is referred to as hemoglobin. Not only does hemoglobin give red blood cells its red color, it also uh, helps to transport oxygen. There are about 200 and 80 million hemoglobin molecules in one red blood cell. That is insane. 280 million of these hemoglobin molecules that are found in one red blood cell. Hemoglobin is composed of the heme portion, which is the ring-like non-protein portion of the hemoglobin, and the globin portion, seen in blue here, which is the protein portion. The heme portion, if we look at it more closely, in the center of each one has an iron ion. This iron ion can combine with one oxygen molecule each, so each hemoglobin has the capacity to bind with four different oxygens. If we multiply that four times 280 million, we could see the total oxygen carrying capacity of one red blood cell. However, a red blood cell never gets fully saturated, but it is set up in this way so that when it does go through the lungs, it can grab as much oxygen as possible. Hemoglobin is also going to transport about 23% carbon dioxide as it passes through out all the cells in the body. Uh, this is going to be brought back to the lungs and then exhaled. This is a waste product of metabolism of the cells. The red blood cell life cycle. The red blood cell lives about 120 days. It cannot synthesize new components. Why? Why do you think it cannot synthesize any new components? If you said, because it doesn't have a nucleus, then you're right. Ruptured red blood cells are removed from circulation and destroyed by fixed phagocytic macrophages in both the spleen and liver. Let's go ahead and discuss this figure, which depicts the formation and destruction of red blood cells. First, we start with the death of red blood cells. 
in both the spleen and liver, there are phagocytic macrophages, which are going to phagocytize the red, the old worn out red blood cells. The globin and heme portions of hemoglobin are split apart. Globin is broken down into amino acids, which can be reused to synthesize other proteins. Iron is removed from the heme portion in the form of iron 3 plus or ferric ion, which associates with the plasma protein transferrin. This transferrin is a transporter for iron 3 plus in the bloodstream. The iron 3 plus transferrin complex is then carried to red bone marrow, where red blood cell precursor cells take it up through receptor mediated endocytosis for use in hemoglobin synthesis. Iron is needed for the heme portion of the hemoglobin molecule and amino acids are needed for the globin portion. Vitamin B12 is also needed for the synthesis of hemoglobin. Erythropoiesis in red bone marrow results in the production of red blood cells which then enter into circulation. When iron is removed from heme, the non-iron portion of heme is converted into biliverdin, a green pigment, and then into bilirubin, a yellow-orange pigment. Bilirubin then enters the blood and is transported into the liver. Within the liver, bilirubin is released by liver cells into bile, which passes into the small intestine and then into the large intestine. In the large intestine, bacteria convert bilirubin into urobilinogen. Some urobilinogen is absorbed back into the blood and converted to a yellow pigment called urobilin and excreted into the urine. Most urobilinogen is eliminated in feces in the form of a brown pigment called stercobilin, which gives feces its characteristic color. So in summation, the amino acids from the globin portion and the iron are both reused in order to make red blood cells, while the heme portion is converted into different pigments that are then excreted from the body. Let's take a look at how red blood cells are produced. This production of red blood cells is termed erythropoiesis. It starts in the red bone marrow with a precursor cell known as the proerythroblast. The proerythroblast divides several times, becoming several different types of cells, and then begins to synthesize hemoglobin. At the end of development, the cell finally ejects its nucleus and becomes what is called a reticulocyte. The loss of the nucleus causes the center of the cell to indent, producing the biconcave shape that the red blood cell is known for. They then pass from the red bone marrow to the bloodstream. Reticulocytes develop into mature red blood cells within one to two days after their release from the red bone marrow. Erythropoiesis and red blood cell destruction normally proceed at the same rate. Let's quickly take a look at some disorders in which red blood cells cannot carry oxygen properly. These disorders cause homeostatic imbalances, so we're throwing the body off from its natural balance of how much oxygen should be there being given to the cells. Anemia is one of these disorders. This is a lack of sufficient healthy red blood cells. The oxygen carrying capacity of the blood is now reduced and it's actually one of the most common blood conditions in the US. Symptoms of anemia include that the person is fatigued and intolerant of the cold. Their skin appears pale due to the low content of red colored hemoglobin. The causes can include iron deficiency, megaloblastic anemia, which is red where the red bone marrow produces large abnormal red blood cells plus others. So the causes can be genetic or just some sort of diet deficiency. 
Other causes of anemia include blood loss, decreased or faulty red blood cell production. One of the number one causes of anemia is iron deficiency or the destruction of red blood cells without them getting old, going through their 120 day life cycle, etc. Anemia caused by faulty red blood cell production includes sickle cell anemia. In sickle cell anemia, the hemoglobin is made abnormally. The S-shaped erythrocytes can just not carry oxygen as well as the other one because they are not made in the same way. You can see a nice healthy red blood cell up here, a sickled cell uh, blood cell uh, down below. This one just does not have the carrying capacity that it needs to have. The other thing is it's only one amino acid change, you can see right here, that creates this effect. The symptoms include anemia, jaundice, the person may experience joint or bone pain, breathlessness, rapid heart rate, abdominal pain, fever, and fatigue. This is, a, this is an inherited disease. What happens if oxygen carrying capacity drops? and the body is not getting the oxygen that it needs. This is when we can see negative regulation of erythropoiesis kick in. If there's not enough oxygen in the body, what is the body going to do to return that back to normal? Remember, whenever we bring something back to normal, it's going to uh, have a negative feedback system that's going to help do that. So the main stimulus to get this system into play is that there's going to be a decrease in the oxygen carrying capacity of blood. So normal oxygen levels in the blood are going to start to decrease and this is going to start the whole system. So we disrupt homeostasis in the system by decreasing uh, the amount of oxygen that's in the blood, oxygen that then gets delivered to any of the other tissues. Well, when that low oxygen blood gets to the kidneys, the kidney cells are going to detect those low oxygen levels. And when they do, they're going to increase the erythropoietin that's secreted into blood. Remember, erythropoietin is that hormone that is going to be needed in order for red blood cells to be produced. As that happens, the proerythroblasts that are in the bone marrow are going to start to mature quickly into reticulocytes. So kidneys will release this erythropoietin. It's going to travel in the blood, make its way finally to the red bone marrow and kick up production um, into reticulocytes. So more and more proerythroblasts will become reticulocytes. Once those reticulocytes enter into the blood, they're gonna eventually mature in about one to two days and there's gonna be a larger number of red blood cells in circulation. Eventually, this is going to help to increase oxygen delivery to the tissues. And once things go back to normal, we can shut this system off because the kidneys are going to detect that the oxygen levels are back to normal and will stop secreting erythropoietin. Let's go ahead and switch gears and start talking about white blood cells. White blood cells are also known collectively as leukocytes. These white blood cells are necessary to help combat infection and inflammation in the body and are part of the immune system. White blood cells, unlike red blood cells, have nuclei, they do not contain hemoglobin, and they're divided into groups as to whether or not they are granular or agranular. Granular leukocytes are so named because they contain chemical-filled cytoplasmic granules that are visible when stained. The next three slides will describe three types of granular leukocytes. They include eosinophils, basophils, and neutrophils. The eosinophil makes up about 2-4% to 4 of white blood cells. They stain red-orange and they take up those acid dyes, which are eosinophilic, giving them the name eosinophil. They have a nucleus that has two or three lobes. They release histaminase, which breaks down histamine, and increases in allergic reactions. 
They phagocytize antigen antibody complexes and are effective against certain parasitic worms. Like other white blood cells, they are capable of leaving the capillaries and entering tissue fluid. Basophils make up 0.5 to 1% of white blood cells. They too can leave the capillaries and release granules at the site of inflammation. These granules include heparin, histamine, and serotonin, which all increase inflammation. These chemicals have a number of effects, which include the constriction of smooth muscles that can lead to breathing difficulty, the dilation of blood vessels that allows the increase in vascular permeability and swelling, and a decrease in blood pressure. Basophils can intensify the inflammatory reaction with the release of these chemicals, and they are also involved in hypersensitivity reactions such as allergies. Neutrophils make up the largest portion of white blood cells, making up 60 to 70 percent of them. They are active phagocytes. Uses, they use lysozymes, strong oxidants, and defensins. They respond most quickly to tissue damage by bacteria as, as they are the first to arrive at the site of infection. They are attracted by chemotaxis or chemical signaling from other cells. Agranular leukocytes are so named because they, even though they have cytoplasmic granules, you cannot see them underneath a light microscope, so they look as if they are agranular. Lymphocytes, which are an agranular uh, white blood cell, make up 20 to 25% of white blood cells. They are the major soldiers of the immune system and they're divided into B cells, T cells, and natural killer cells. B cells are the ones that eventually produce antibodies. T cells are divided into different groups, but they attack virus infected cells, fungi, transplanted cells, cancer cells, and some bacteria. While natural killer cells are going to attack a wide variety of infectious microbes and certain tumor cells. These get discussed in more detail when we get to the immune chapter. Monocytes, another agranular leukocyte, makes up 3 to 8 percent of white blood cells. They migrate into tissue at infectious sites and they enlarge and differentiate into macrophages. Macrophages are very active phagocytic cells, and these are the second to arrive at a bacterial infection. Even though they are the second to arrive, they actually arrive in more numbers than neutrophils, and therefore they are capable of more destruction of microbes at that site. The functions of white blood cells. The general function of white blood cells is to combat invaders by phagocytosis or immune responses. They can live a few days except lymphocytes which can live years. The specific ways by which white blood cells can combat these invaders will be discussed in more detail in the immunology chapter. White blood cells, unlike red blood cells, have the special ability to be able to leave the blood vessels. Red blood cells cannot leave the blood vessels, but white blood cells can. So how do, they, how do they do this? The way in which they do this is by a process known as emigration. Emigration takes place when the white blood cell will actually start to roll along the endothelium of the blood vessel, and then it actually sticks to and squeezes in between the endothelial cells. They will start to do this when they are called by chemotaxis to a certain site. There are different signals that can call them out, and these precise signals are going to vary for the different types of white blood cells. For platelets, the main function of platelets is to form a plug to slow blood loss. The hormone thrombopoietin is what stimulates the production of platelets to be made. Myeloid stem cells are going to develop into megakaryoblasts and then megakaryoblasts turn into megakaryocytes. 
megakaryocytes can then splinter off into two to 3,000 different fragments. These are going to create the platelets. They have many vesicles inside of them that has, had developed as the megakaryocytes were developing. Even though they have all these vesicles, they have no nucleus. The vesicles contain blood clot promoting chemicals within them. They have a very short lifespan of about five to nine days. Hemostasis, not to be confused with hematopoiesis, is the sequence of events that stops bleeding from a damaged blood vessel. The three mechanisms that reduce the loss of blood from vessels includes facular spasm, platelet plug formation, and blood clotting or coagulation. Vascular spasm occurs immediately when blood vessels are damaged. This occurs by the smooth muscles that contract due to the damaged blood vessel. This process can reduce blood loss for several minutes to several hours. Platelet plug formation occurs in a series of steps. The first seen here is platelet adhesion. Platelets are going to contact and stick to different parts of the damaged blood vessel. This is due to the signals being released once the vessel is damaged. The second step of platelet plug formation includes the platelet release reaction. At this point, the sticky platelets become activated. They extend many projections and they liberate the contents of their vesicles, including ADP, serotonin, and thromboxane A2. As the platelets release their contents, these chemicals make other platelets sticky and cause the platelets to gather together. This accumulation of platelets is the third step of the platelet release reaction and is referred to as platelet aggregation. As they come together more and more, they form what is known as a platelet plug. A platelet plug can stop blood loss completely if the hole in a vessel is not too large. Blood clotting occurs after the platelet plug has been formed. Blood clotting or coagulation is a series of chemical reactions that form fibrin thread. Clotting is a complex cascade of enzymatic reactions that has two different pathways, the extrinsic pathway or the intrinsic pathway. The extrinsic pathway has fewer steps and occurs rapidly within seconds. This is because tissue factor leaks into the blood from the cells outside the blood vessels and initiates the formation of prothrombinase. In the intrinsic pathway, this is more complex and occurs much more slowly, taking several minutes. Activators are in direct contact with blood or contained within the blood. Outside tissue damage is not needed for the intrinsic pathway uh, to begin. Prothrombinase is formed, but after several reactions. This figure shows the difference between the extrinsic pathway and the intrinsic pathway. The extrinsic pathway um, has tissue trauma uh, coming to the blood vessel from the outside. Because the blood vessel damage comes from the outside, such as getting an injury, a cut, etc., tissue factor leaks in and the process happens much quicker. In the intrinsic pathway, the trauma happens from within the vessel itself. Because blood flows through the vessels all the time, all day, there are little injuries that can happen within the blood vessel itself. Because the injury is on the inside for the intrinsic pathway, this process takes a little longer to start. But either the extrinsic pathway or the intrinsic pathway all end in the formation of prothrombinase which leads into the common pathway for both. The beginning of the common pathway is marked by the formation of prothrombinase. Once prothrombinase is made, prothrombinase and calcium catalyze the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin. Thrombin, in the presence of calcium, 
converts fibrinogen into fibrin, forming the threads of the clot. In the description of this video, I'm going to link another video that shows um, kind of all these steps visually so that you can see it a little bit better. I know some people are visual and really like to see it that way. So I'm going to link that so if you want to later, you can click on it and you can watch the platelet activation and factors for clot formation. So you can kind of see all these processes um, in a visual formation. The clot will then go through clot retraction, which is the consolidation or tightening of the fibrin clot. As the clot contracts, fibrin attached to the vessel walls pulls the vessel walls closer together to decrease further damage. This allows other cells to repair the damage underneath. Fibroblasts can form connective tissue, new endothelial cells can start to form, and this will stay there until all the area has then been repaired by these other cells. At that point, then the clot can eventually fall off. Even when there is no damage, blood clots tend to form from time to time. Blood clotting is a positive feedback mechanism, which means that things keep going in the same direction and is amplified. Therefore, it has a tendency to enlarge the clot and potentially block off blood flow through the undamaged vessel. The fibrinolytic system is responsible for dissolving small, inappropriate clots. It also dissolves clots at the site of damage once repair is finished. So like we just talked about before, um, where the clot was formed and then the tissue underneath is repaired, once the tissue underneath is repaired, then the fibrinolytic system can then come in and help to dissolve that. It also can help dissolve clots that are forming where they should not be formed. The fibrinolytic system is comprised of plasminogen. Plasminogen is an inactive plasma enzyme, which is incorporated into a clot when a clot is formed. When plasminogen is activated into plasmin, plasmin dissolves the clot by digesting fibrin. Once the clot is dissolved, then the pieces can be taken up by macrophages in the area. The final portion of this chapter covers blood groups and blood types. I have already made a video uh, that goes over all of this, so please stop now and see my video on ABO blood groups, RH factor, and blood typing, as I will not be covering them in this video, but it does conclude this chapter. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch my video. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to write them in the comments.